I V M. Hello and welcome to yet another episode of Simplified, and this one is special because we have someone who is seriously, you know, <laughs> he is. Uh, oh, anyway, you'll come to know in a minute. But basically, the background of this episode is we did another episode a while back in which we spoke about oxygen, and uh, we really spoke about oxygen. Um, you know, how it's generated and, you know, how it's transported and things like that. And someone I know who's going to come on the show now said that you really didn't cover the medical aspects of it. And so he's volunteered to step in and set that right. So warm welcome to Nitin Arora. Uh, he is Dr. Nitin Arora and he's based in the UK and he is an intensivist as opposed to as Tony will... Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're famously insensitivists, so we are a few yeah. letters off, so... <laughs> <laughs> so welcome, Dr. Nitin. Yeah, welcome. Uh, w- welcome, Dr. Hello. Nitin, who has woken up at uh, 4 a.m., half an hour before yes. his scheduled time, yeah. uh, just to impart some wisdom to simplified listeners. Thank you so much, Doctor, for joining us. Good morning. Uh, hi, and hello to all of your listeners. I've been a listener of the show for quite a while now. So actually, when the opportunity presented itself to come in, I volunteered to jump in. And uh, thank you for inviting me. And can we please just use first names? I'm uncomfortable with Dr. Nathan. And yeah, so, so at work, we are famously a first names only unit. So from everyone from cleaners to porters to the hospital chief executive, is addressed by their first name. And again, today I thought I'd come in and have a little chat about oxygen. What I didn't realize was I should have spent a little bit of time preparing some jokes. (laughs) <laughs> I, just realized that. I think that part of the conversation we'll take care of we are we are not you, uh, you don't need to uh, what you're trying to say is you don't need to haber too much on the process yeah <laughs> no, that didn't yeah, come out right we, at all no. we, we start the show and then we are like we should have spent a little time researching facts uh, but uh, <laughs> the, the jokes <laughs> part <that> but <laughs> could you start a little but, yeah. by telling us what you do doctor like uh, which unit uh, where uh, in the UK yeah. right so um I trained in India. I worked in India in medicine for five years after I finished. Then at that point of time, there was no training in intensive care in India, which is why in a lot of corporate hospitals in India, you'll find people that have trained in America, Australia, or the UK. So I came over here and then the plan was to come back. And then 17 years later, I still haven't. So I work in intensive care. I've been an intensive care consultant for nearly 10 years now in Birmingham. I work at University Hospitals Birmingham. In addition, I have a bit of an interest in online education. So I was the digital media lead for the Intensive Care Society, which is our national body for a period of time. And then currently I'm chair for learning and we do a fair number of podcasts and webinars, uh, which can be found on our YouTube channels and podcast channels, as as well as uh, we're developing a new e-learning app for intensive care, which we hope to make available worldwide. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, also, yeah, you expect us to call you Nitin after that? No, we, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> so, no, there are so many. That's interesting. There are so many strands we can pick over there. I feel that oxygen is. Uh, uh, I mean, I shouldn't be saying this right now. It feels like oxygen is restricting this conversation uh, because there are so many different strands that could be picked on from. But I'm just keen to ask one thing before we jump into the oxygen part of things. Has things changed in India since you left? Because it didn't have that uh, education that you were looking for in intensive yeah. uh, care. Yes, absolutely. So I work very closely with the Indian Society for Critical Care. So they have, they're kind enough to invite me to join various committees and invite me to their conferences. And things have definitely changed. There is very high quality intensive care training available in India now. And uh, thankfully, after a bit of time, we are actually getting very good research studies coming out of India as well. So things have definitely changed. If I was in India today, I wouldn't leave probably. Mm -hmm. The problem, of course, is that intensive care in India tends to be concentrated in the big cities and the smaller towns still have a problem accessing good quality intensive care. 
Yeah, or any care uh, really for that matter. Yes, Sadly, course, as we've yeah. seen over the last. Are you uh, being critical of care? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> not quite, not quite. And if I can say another line, until about eighteen months ago, most people that work in intensive care had never thought about oxygen. Oxygen was taken for granted. It arrives in the hospital in a big tanker. You open the knob, it comes out. We'd never thought about it, and then suddenly in the last eighteen months or so, we've had to think about it. Now, oddly enough, I have had an interest in ICU design and infrastructure for a period of time. So that just meant that when, when this pandemic arrived, the hospital, that someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, okay, you're up, uh, you're going to make an oxygen plan and you know expansion plan. So that, which is essentially what I've done for the last 15 months, COVID ICU and expansion plans, infrastructure. So, you know, planning, publishing, stuff like that. Incredible. So uh, yeah, I, I think uh, let's this is what is uh, yeah yeah. Go what ahead, what go is ahead, interesting? Go. Yeah, what is interesting for me is this, right? In, so my father was in ICU in uh, February for 18 days. He 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 passed away. He he were, he was in for aspiration pneumonia, and um, he had a lot of uh, other issues. As well, and uh, they so I I got to know a little bit about uh, ventilators and uh, intensivists and uh, everything and. They did an admirable job of keeping him conscious and uh, in good health, you know, while the basic infection was being taken care of. But it was he was old, he was 82, he had a lot of other issues and he wasn't able to make it. What struck me, and uh, so there was equipment in that place that even the chest physician didn't know how to operate. So it had to be the intensivist. And so, you know, the level of knowledge... So the intensivist had to know a lot of medicine also, but a lot of technology as well. And what struck me was that technology is a really huge part of this entire operation. And so yours must be the fastest evolving discipline within that thing. So that was my observation. Thank you. And I'm sorry for your loss, Narayan. I, I should have said that earlier because I, I remember you mentioned this uh, in a previous podcast as well. Mm. And you're right. Intensive care is one of the youngest specialties in medicine, uh, but it's not as young as you might think. It dates back to the 1950s uh, when oh. there was a big polio epidemic in Europe and they developed the old fashioned heart lung machines. But then for the next 20 odd years, I see languished. And it was only in the 80s that there was an explosion in intensive care. And to be fair, the explosion in intensive care largely came from uh, heart surgery. So in the late 70s and early 80s, we started doing cardiac bypasses. And then it was realized that actually a huge big determinant in the outcome of these patients who have heart surgery, valvular surgery or bypass surgery is the kind of attention to detail and intensive care that they get after. And then we started realizing that there are a lot of diseases that we can help with intensive care. And so over the last, when I've been doing intensive care for just over 20 years now, and I am stunned at how far we have come. And oddly enough, oddly enough, uh, we are using fewer drugs and actually we're using less technology than we used to 20 years ago. 20 years ago, we thought the technology would revolutionize stuff. And then ultimately we've come to the conclusion that actually the more we do to people, the more we mess them up. So you try and do as little as you can get away with. So don't try and get their oxygen to 100%, put it at 90%. That's enough to keep you alive. And then you're not injuring the lungs while providing oxygen. Do not push the blood pressure too much because you will then stress out the heart and the circulatory system, all of that stuff. Don't give antibiotics for three weeks. You will get antibiotic resistance. Give antibiotics for short, sharp courses, five to seven days. So stuff like that. So we actually, in some ways, we're doing less than it was thought at one point that we should try and do. And actually that works better. Yeah, I think so uh, our education, do. yeah, I think our education system could also do with a little bit of that. Don't try to do too much, just <laughs> focus on a few things and do them well. But doctor, it seems to me that an intensivist or somebody who's uh, trained for the ICU will need to be a cross-disciplinarian uh, across various medical fields, I want to say. Y- yes, yeah. So I actually did my qualification in medicine. So i did my internal medicine. I did my MRCP exam. So I finished my rotation in medicine. I did, in all, I did nearly four years of medicine. Then I did another four years of anesthesia. And then I did four years of intensive care training. So I was a slowpoke. So it took me nearly 12, 13 years of training to become a consultant. Um, 
And the minimum amount you need in the UK, so the UK standard is you need to have done at least one year, but most people do two years of medicine. And you need to have done at least one, but some people do two years of anesthesia. And then you also need to have done at least six months of pediatrics, ideally one year. And you need to have worked in pediatric ICU, neuro ICU. So I like to call intensivists one of the only two classes of general doctors in the, in the yeah. hospital. So everyone looks after their patients. The surgeons cut the internal physicians do their own thing. The gynecologists do only women. Pediatricians do only under 18s. Uh, in, on a typical day, I will see anyone from six months old to 90 years old, pregnant women, old people, anything. Uh, wow. So between emergency departments and intensive care, we are probably the only people in hospital that will see anyone. <laughs> Well, I have to say one thing about uh, gynecology. I saw uh, there used to be this writer named Richard Gordon uh, back in course. the 60s who used to write. He's very popular. Delightful he used to be. Books. Yeah, he used to be. And uh, so his, the protagonist of many of his books was a, a surgeon named Lancelot, Sir Lancelot Spratt. So uh, in one of the books, there is a situation where Sir Lancelot Spratt, uh, Spratt has to perform an uh, emergency delivery. Okay, someone is delivering and uh, he's the only doctor around. And someone asks him, uh, are you sure you can do it? I mean, it's like it's forever. It's 40 years since you, uh, he says, I, of course, I don't remember much, but I know that there's nothing much in gynecology. You just have to stand in the slips and take the catch. I remember two things about Sir Lancelot Spratt. One is that catch in the slips. And the other thing I remember being impressed at is because Sir Lancelot uh, had a Rolls Royce. And I used to think, oh, okay, so consultants in um, the UK have Rolls Royces. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> yeah. But if he, if he was Sir Lancelot, you would need a leg slip. <laughs> but I had a, you know, anesthetist uh, doctor in my neighborhood and I, it, you know, kind of remember what he always used to say. I mean, uh, you know, I grew up Catholic. So his, his line was that uh, God is the first anesthetist because when he created Eve, he actually put Adam to sleep before taking out wow. the red. So, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah but uh, if I can ask a very basic question, what exactly is the need for an intensive care unit and uh, how does it work? Yeah, I was about to ask something very similar. So you can kind of take both together, I guess. It's like what qualifies a person for needing the ICU versus, I don't know what, yeah, what yeah, else yeah. actually. Yeah. Okay. So there are three important things about ICU. And you will notice that I'm not going to say equipment. Okay. So there are three important things about intensive care. So intensive care, we, we look after the sickest patients in the hospital. So if you have a disease, and an organ dysfunction. So if your oxygen saturations are falling or your blood pressure is dropping or your kidneys are stopping working, then you will need care that is more than can be delivered in or, on an ordinary ward. Back in the day, 30, 40 years ago, we would try and do a lot of things on the wards. We would try and put in central lines. We would do dialysis on the wards. And then slowly it was realized that what you need is you need to cohort these patients together and have a bunch of doctors and nurses looking after them who only look after sick patients. So you have a bunch of people that only look after cardiac patients, which is cardiology department. You don't, the era of the old fashioned general surgeon and general medicine person is over. You still need someone with a broad overview, but you get much better results if you can have people that specialize in this stuff. And intensivists, what we specialize in is sick people. What we specialize in is people that have multi-organ failure or at least respiratory failure and if we can cohort these people together then what you get is you get experienced staff who know exactly how to look after these patients you get improved nursing ratios so in the uk on a ward you will have one nurse for eight patients you will have one doctor for 30 patients on the ward typically at night in an intensive care, you will always have one-to-one -one nursing. In fact, on our 24-bed ICU, we always have 25 nurses because there's a nurse in charge who is there to, who's the senior most, who's there to help others supervise and stuff. So we have a minimum of 25 nurses on every shift. We have a minimum of three doctors on every shift. So what you are then doing is on an ordinary ward in a 12-hour shift with 30-odd patients, one doctor is going to spend 20 minutes per patient. 
at best, once you take out phone calls, lunch breaks, doing the paperwork. And half of that time will be spent entering data on the computer. In intensive care, I have the unbelievable luxury that my doctors can spend an hour with the patient. My nurses can spend a 12-hour shift with the patient. So then what you get to do is you get attention to detail. And what we have found is for 20 years, intensive care searched for magic bullets. And I can tell you, oh, this may sound patronizing, but I can tell you that COVID has brought out the worst instincts of intensive care again. What we've been doing is, and the media are partly to blame for this, we've been searching for magic bullets. Yeah. But magic bullets do not exist. We, do, we haven't found a magic bullet, but every week there is something new, hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, whatever. And what we found was that the best predictor in the UK, at least, of ICU survival, apart from how sick the patient was in, when they came in, was how much a unit had to stretch. So we had to go up three times. So our ICU nurses were now spending one third of the time with the patients. We were spending one third of the time that we normally do with our patients. And what happens is it's not just one third of the time you get cognitive overload. You're not used to dealing with so many sick and dying patients. And suddenly, actually, you're not working at one third efficiency. You're probably working at less than one third yeah. efficiency. And units that were not stretched had outcomes that were very similar to their baseline. And units that were stretched, the more you stretched the units, the worse the outcome got, which is why mm -hmm. during our second wave, we set up a national mm -hmm. system of transfers. So we admitted 700 patients to ICU in the second wave. Of them, nearly 300 were transferred to other hospitals because we had live dashboard. We had an operations manager meeting every morning across multiple hospitals. And whichever hospital was least stretched, they would. And we had dedicated transfer teams. And we ended up sending patients as far as Newcastle, which is 250 miles away, so 400 kilometers mm -hmm. away. And we sent nearly 25 patients there. So we were able to do this because we have a fairly centralized uh, healthcare system, which is free at mm -hmm. point of delivery. Mm -hmm. Now, I remember uh, talking to a colleague in New York, who even though made Governor Cuomo had said that, yes, we will have a robust system of transfers. It didn't eventually work because it's a fee-for-service model. No hospital chief executive wants to let go of paying patients. So exactly, they just yeah. kept stretched and stretched and stretched. Right. And then the worst outcomes were in some hospitals that took Medicaid patients because they are lower paid than insured patients. Yeah. And so some hospitals had an, a nurse-to-patient ratio that was three times worse than other hospitals because they couldn't transfer out. We were lucky enough that we had the facility to transfer out. So one of the most important things is staff time, attention to detail. And it's little things, little things, attention to detail, like regular suctioning. You don't suction a patient through the endotracheal tube for three, four hours. You double the chance of getting a pneumonia. Yeah. Uh, you turn yeah. the patient regularly. We, it's Before COVID, we had not had a bed sore on the unit for nearly six years. Because we, we police that very, very carefully. Yeah. You know, it's little things like that. Not giving mm -hmm. them too much oxygen, not giving them too little oxygen, keeping their blood pressure in a very narrow band, just enough. Because if you're giving, say, noradrenaline or adrenaline to a patient, as you can imagine, uh, it's going to cause tachycardia, it's going to cause palpitations, it's going to, in an old patient, in someone that has pre-existing heart disease, you could actually precipitate a heart attack. However, if your blood pressure is too low, you're not getting blood flowing to the brain and the kidneys and the heart. So you're again going to cause trouble. So you have to get it just right. And the only way to get it just right is constant tinkering. Well, so unfortunately, yeah. we end up tinkering a lot. I have two unnecessary observations and one question. Uh, the <laughs> first unnecessary observation is uh, just like how they say uh, any discussion on the internet will eventually move towards talking about Hitler. I think any discussion with uh, about medicine will eventually move towards, uh, there becomes a point where you criticize the US medical system. So I think that moment in oh, this, uh, yeah, I think that moment for this has uh, is past. Every time I, uh, every time my wife and I uh, watch a John Oliver episode, we just look at each other, thank goodness we are not in the US for some yes. reason or the other. I'm the second unnecessary observation was, I think since we're talking about the ICU, we should stop talking about anything that's bullet, silver bullet or magic bullet or something. It just seems a little inappropriate to me. But the question that I had for you, doctor, the actual question that I had was, uh, how difficult is it to scale up or once this wave is over, scale down uh, intensive care operation? Sorry, Narin, I don't know if your question was kind of related to that, but uh, please go ahead. 
Um, yeah. Should we wait for Nareen's question? Yeah, yeah. so and no, then my, I can mine answer was everything together. Absolutely the same thing. So I have a personal angle to this. Whatever Nitin said, all of that happened to my father. So when he was when he was taken to the hospital, I we weren't in town. Me and my wife, my son was, and he acted very quickly. He picked him up, rushed to the hospital. We have our own hospital that didn't have an ICU. We went to a hospital which did, and they you know intubated him and they did everything and they put and they saved him. And but it was a raging, uh, uh, you know, infection in the lungs. So they had to treat him with uh, with uh, antibiotics. And antibiotics take a little time to work. And you have to keep the patient alive and healthy in that time. And that's when I, by that time, we had gone out of town. We came back. When that, that's when I realized my father is a doctor, was a doctor himself. And so a lot of people treating him, I they were his junior. So I knew all of them. And uh, so they would, you know, they would they would tell me things that they probably wouldn't tell other people, and they would they would say things like this, you know, his his, his blood pressure is dropping, so now his kidneys are getting involved, so we need to increase his blood pressure, and that's why I need to put central line things. Like that. So what and all of that, it was the intensivist who was the final decision maker, and uh, they kept having uh, little conferences, and they'd have discussions, and then it would happen. And uh, the point, what Nitin was saying, was the level of, uh, you know, attention to detail is what kept him alive. I mean, he passed, he didn't make it because uh, he was really old and infirm, but he, they did keep him alive for 18 days. And he was conscious for nearly every one of those days. So he was like that way, he was okay. So if you really have to increase this. Now, India is woefully short of all kinds of medical facilities for a multiple multitude of reasons. First of all, we have a very large population, which used to like very calmly accept death and die. Most of rural India, if you fell ill, you just went, crawled into your bed and died. And now, you know, India has become more prosperous and even the poorest of poor people know that there is uh you know there are there are facilities which will keep you alive they want and in you know that that's why there is pressure on medical facilities because people don't want to die and they go and go out so all of a sudden because of the prosperity is one of the reasons we need more facilities so how easy is i'm sure there are finer minds who are thinking about this right now seriously they really want to have more one of the the standard refrains of this entire COVID epidemic was we didn't have ICU facilities. So how quickly uh, do we can we expand? That that was a very similar question to Deepak. I I like how we're getting the doctor to triage life and simplify <laughs> yeah. by throwing multiple <laughs> different things at him. So, <laughs> right, folks. Now this is this is a really difficult one. Can I split this into two? So I'm going to try and split this into two, as in one scale up on the individual hospital basis. So suddenly you have 22 extra ICU patients. How do you scale up? Or you are expecting to double your number in the next week. How do you scale up? That is going to come from my personal experience. The second thing is, how do you scale up on a national level? And that one, again, I can claim a little bit of expertise because I was on the National Workforce Planning Committee for Intensive Care for a few years. And... uh, I have actually just submitted a paper on on, on UK workforce very recently, which hasn't been published yet. But I must say that some of this may not necessarily apply to India, but the broader principles will be very similar. So on an individual unit basis, scaling up is really difficult. This is how we did it. And then I'll talk about the problems we had as well. So one was uh, equipment. That was the easiest bit. Our main problem was monitoring equipment. All we did was we have 30 odd operating theaters. Uh, We closed everything except five of them. So only emergencies and trauma and pediatric trauma and obstetrics and cancer work would be done. And then what we did was we had smaller hospitals on the side in the private sector, which did not have ICUs. So the government block booked the private hospital because all ele- they were not going to be able to do any surgery anyway, because we had mm-hmm. uh, commandeered all the anesthetists. So we, we block booked those hospitals. Uh, we did aggressive COVID testing on the staff and patients in those hospitals. So cancer work, urgent surgeries continued in those hospitals. They were on patients who didn't need ICU beds. If unfortunately you were someone that needed a relatively urgent surgery and you needed an ICU bed, it was difficult. If you needed emergency surgery, we carried on. 
because we always had a small number of ICU beds. In fact, it got to one stage where of the five hospitals in Birmingham, one was designated as the non-COVID ICU. So all non-COVID patients went there. Uh, if they needed to have emergency surgery in a COVID hospital, they had the surgery and then were transferred out. So as soon as we heard about the epidemic in Italy, we set up a very aggressive two-week, very short two-week staff training program. One of the things uh, I'll say very immodestly is uh, we rather illegally, so I, I wrote um, a book, a textbook of intensive care uh, for the beginner. So it's called a beginner's guide to intensive care. It's like a dummy's guide. Uh, it's meant for someone in the first three months of intensive care. So what we very illegally did was we made, so I obviously had the PDF and we just printed out 200 copies of the book and we just handed it to everyone that volunteered to come and work in intensive care. Oh, in that's engineering college level. Uh, yeah. uh, yes, 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 yes. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, it's I amazing that these tactics, you know, right, right from like first year engineering all the way to ICU. You basically uh, pirated your own book. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, technically, I hold the copyright. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> no, but yeah, it was the deal of the hour. Yeah. 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 And actually, I contacted the publishers and they made the book free on their app for a period of six months. Right. So actually, uh, but that took a few weeks. So they, they, had, they had to go some through some legal procedure. So that took about three weeks. So we, we couldn't really wait. So I told them that I was going to just print off stuff. And they said, yeah, look, this is an emergency. You do whatever you want. <laughs> uh, so so we, we, for about two weeks, we had six, eight, 10 hour training sessions every day, uh, which is not to say that in two weeks, these guys became uh, ICU nurses or ICU doctors. But what they did was they got to a stage where they had had orientation and induction. So they were not dangerous in mm. ICU. And uh, they could do things like they could help to turn the patient. Um, oh, if nothing else, just make tea for the staff on their coffee break so that when they when they go on a break, there is tea waiting already instead of wasting 10 minutes making tea. And, you know, running around, getting stuff. So we managed the staff and the equipment. The third was the ventilators. Uh, and for some reason, all governments in the world got hung up on ventilators because in the minds, I think, of the average politician, uh, ICU is a ventilator, <laughs> which means mm-hmm. the ventilator is one of Okay, it's it's a vital machine, but it's not the crux of intensive care. And on a typical day in my ICU, less than half of the patients are going to be on a ventilator. Okay, so we managed to cobble together some ventilators. We had old ventilators that we had in decommission that we had kept for training when we replaced our ventilators. So we were able to double our ventilators. It wasn't that big a problem. There was a program for emergency ventilator manufacture, none of which worked because it's not something you can cobble together in a garage. So they're sophisticated machines. And what we got was, you know, the the... the cobbled together stuff we got was very basic machines. They would have been okay in the 1980s, but today's ventilators are a bit different. And then we came to the two things that no one had ever thought about. So previously, when we've talked about, so what we do is we have a major incident planning meeting. We have major incident drills. You know, there is a bombing, 50 new patients have suddenly come in. What are you going to do? The problem with this is, this was like a major incident, but a major incident normally lasts for two days, three days, and then it starts scaling down. So what you can do is you can get everyone in and then slowly you can let them go. Whereas with this, we knew this was going to last for a long time. So we were very careful with not trying to burn out our staff. And we knew right. some of our staff would get sick as well. So we had to phase it in slowly. And we, we had to make sure that it was sustainable. Then we got to the problem of oxygen. Mm-hmm. Now, this is where it got interesting. So in the UK, as standard, all hospitals with an ICU need to have a centralized liquid oxygen tank. Uh, liquid oxygen in a tank is stored at about it's it's basically the liquid oxygen tank is a metal walled giant thermos flask Mm -hmm. we call it a vacuum insulated evaporator so you have a steel outer a steel inner and then in the middle there's pretty much vacuum it's evacuated to roughly one kilopascal so which is one hundredth of atmospheric pressure uh, which is apparently deemed to be a sustainable vacuum they've tried doing more, getting it down to 0.1 pascal, and it doesn't seem to work. You get more leaks. Uh, Most of the oxygen is liquid, but obviously it's kept at 160 or so. And uh, obviously with the saturation, there's a bit of vapor on top and there is a pressure release valve. It's normally kept at about seven uh, seven bar, so 700 kilopascals. The release valve is typically set at 10. And then there is a system of release tubes. So you take the vapor out, 
And the typical tank is a 3,000 to 5,000 liter tank, though we now have a 12,000 liter tank. And each liter of liquid oxygen gives you at STP roughly uh, 900 to 1,000 liters of um, gaseous oxygen. So actually, it's, it's quite a lot of oxygen. Mm. And um, you have a pressure differential, so at the top and the bottom, so or and it rests on a scale. So you always know how much is left. And actually, we, we got live updates on an app because uh, it was all automated. Because uh, it, over here, what happens is uh, we have a contract with the British Oxygen Company, and they will monitor how much oxygen is left in your tank. They know the historic usage, and they will come and refill it two days before it finishes. So they come and come every five, six days. At one point last year, they were coming every day. Now, once it comes out, it then has to go through a heating grid, pressure regulator valve, and go through. Now, as you can imagine, if you are using a lot of oxygen, the temperature of the rest of the liquid oxygen will drop because it's evaporating quickly. And suddenly you find that your output from your oxygen tank is dropping. And so what we had to do was we had to, and this was winter over here. So what we had to do was we rigged up warm water, 35 degree water sprinkler system. Wow. So when we started dropping, uh, the sprinkler system started. But in the same way, uh, they had the opposite problem in India. Uh, yeah. It was 45 degrees in Rotak, and I have a friend in Rotak, uh, and uh, they uh, they had the opposite problem. They had their they had overpressure, and uh, so after talking to me, when I said, "Look, we rigged up this system," they rigged up a cold water sprinkler system. <laughs> this is amazing, cool and this is oh unprecedented. God, wow. Yeah, it's unprecedented. It's a brilliant solution. It's just yeah. absolutely a brilliant solution. I want to say the J word over here, but since we're talking about ICU, I'm just. Uh... Yeah. I think it's just Jugaad. Jugaad. <laughs> last year we worked on Jugaad. Yeah. Honestly, in this country, everything is so tightly regulated. Everything has to go through 23 committees. Last year we worked on Jugaad. <laughs> and so Jugaad, so coming again to Jugaad. I mean, your uh, printing, uh, your creative licensing was an example of Jugaad in some sense. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And then what we did was uh, with the oxygen, we tested all our ventilators. We found some of our ventilators used more oxygen, some used less oxygen. So we had to find out uh, where to put them. Then we found that suddenly, because we'd never even thought about this, mm -hmm. most people had it, that our oxygen, uh, our ICU only had an oxygen ring, which was capable of delivering 600, 600 liters a minute. And we then thought about, okay, is there any way to extend this? But our ICU is about 400 meters from the oxygen tank. And as you know, there are fixed pipes and the flow, because the pressure is fixed, it's coming at four bar. So the only thing that really determines flow, if you go back to your fluid mm -hmm. dynamics and mm -hmm. your laminar flow, the Poiseuille's equation, which says flow is dependent on the fourth power of the radius. Yeah. And that you can't basically, you know, crack open the whole hospital and change all the oxygen pipes in the middle of a yeah. pandemic. So what we had to do was we had to reverse the rule of the last, the reverse things that we had learned in the last 50 years, I said, we cohort our sick patients together and stuff like that. But what we had, had to do was, since we had to, so ICU was full, we had to expand into the wards. Each ward would only have 400 liters of oxygen. That was barely enough for uh, five high flow patients. So at one point, I had 28 high flow patients spread across six different wards. So basically, we put four sick patients in one ward, four sick patients in the next ward, four sick patients in the upstairs ward. And so uh, on a typical day, so we had one consultant who was inside the ICU. So we had a group of people who were inside the ICU and we had one consultant and one registrar who were, registrar who were outside the ICU. And uh, on the day that we were outside the ICU, we were typically averaging, so in a 12-hour shift, somewhere between 20 and 25,000 steps. Because you were just walking wow. up and down wow. corridors. wow. So, so you had to outsource the ICU to the wards, basically. Yes, we moved the ICU to the ward and we spread it out. Wow. We That's we incredible. decentralized ICU. And because because, there was because, no other because of the diameter of the pipe. <laughs> because of the diameter of the pipes, exactly. Yes. Uh, and then we discovered new stuff. So if you've ever been in hospital, you know there's an oxygen thing on the wall and you open the valve and it goes up. Yeah. Okay, what we discovered is... And this again, um, we're doing a project on this. And I'll tell you about this one. You may find this interesting. So you open it, it goes up to 15. Mm. 
And we found they are very accurate. So we had oxygen calibration kits. We found up to 15, it's very accurate. The problem is people don't stop at 15. If you say 10, people will go to 10 and stop. Mm -hmm. If you say 15, 15 is all the way to the top. So they'll keep turning it until it goes, until it goes and sits at the top. Yeah. The, ball, the rotating ball goes and, sits, goes and sits at the top, which is about half an inch above the 15 level. We found that uh, depending on where you were and what brand you used, that if you have it stuck right at the top, it gives you between 40 and 60 liters. So we started, so what we did was we made a Google Form spreadsheet. Uh, every morning, the senior nurse on every single ward would go around and see how much oxygen was being used, enter it on their smartphone, onto the Google Forms app. It would come to me by the evening, uh, but by, by, uh, in an hour or so. And then we would decide, okay, which ward has oxygen surplus, which ward has uh, oxygen deficit, and how do we move patients around? So it was uh, crazy. Uh, not something we are trained for, not something we'd ever thought about. But uh, as you said, it's Jugaad. Yeah, no, it's this is so brilliant. I mean, uh, you know, you have to uh, figure these things out on the fly. There are yeah. people whose ha lives hang by a thread. So it's not like you can take a decision tomorrow. You have to be. And oftentimes you are the only yeah. one who has to take the decisions. And, uh, you know, yeah. and, uh, and just another example of how a spreadsheet can solve uh, any yeah. problem. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Excel but then again, no, no, no. Not a spreadsheet. That's the key, Deepak. So, mm -hmm. so what we found was we had a spreadsheet, a shared spreadsheet, and everyone is scared of spreadsheets. Right, People yeah. wouldn't enter numbers <laughs> into the spreadsheet. So what we had to do was we had to make a Google, Google Forms document. So it was yeah. drop-down menus. So they would just tick the box. Google Forms, so interesting. Yeah, so yeah, you yeah. would get the response. Oh, Brilliant. The responses came in the spreadsheet. I oh. saw the spreadsheet, but the yeah. end user did not, the, the, the respondent did not see the spreadsheet. They saw the Google yeah. Forms. Yeah, yeah, this, this is, is why they say the healthcare workers are, I mean, always a class apart. The form might be temporary, but the class is permanent. <laughs> class is permanent. <laughs> so, so, so can, 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 can I go back to Nareen's fly? You said something about fly, Nareen. Yeah. What was it again? No, on the fly. So you have On to, the fly. Perfect. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Can, I, can I use that at a, as a segue? Yes. Okay. Okay. Have, okay. You, have you heard of uh, something called the fly, fly sticker splash solution? Fly in the ointment, I've heard. No, no. no. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Let me tell you about the fly sticker splash solution. Okay. Yeah. So this is an all-male group. Uh, if you had <laughs> a female in this group, they would say enthusiastically, yes, Nathan, you're right. Okay. But you, some of you may disagree with this. But uh, you know that men, when they tinkle, they sprinkle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know this one. Yeah. Okay. So Chiffol Airport in Amsterdam a few years ago, what they did was in their urinals, they put a sticker of a fly. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So and unconsciously, you will aim for the fly. Yeah. They reduce ah. that sprinkling by 80%. And then you're thinking, he's talking about oxygen, and now he's talking about tinkle and spline, and sp <laughs> whatever. Uh, and then uh, what we have is, currently we have a study going on. So we, we wandered around the hospital. We did an audit now that we have a bit more time. And we found that more than 70% of the patients who were prescribed 15 liters oxygen, it was pushed right to the top. So they were getting 35, 40 liters. So we're wasting a lot of oxygen with no additional benefit to the patient. Because if they really need 40 liters, they should be on something else. Um, yeah. So uh, what we've done is we've just put a red dot yeah. at the 15 mark. And secondly, we've started prescribing 14 and a half liters. The difference between Brilliant. 14 and a half and 15 Amazing, is nothing. yeah. So... Uh, this is we calling this uh, using behavior behavioral psychology to yeah. Yeah. Uh, save Amazing. oxygen. Yeah, this uh, is, so, yeah. I was about to say that, doctor, because it sounds like something like a Danny Kahneman would uh, prescribe. This is, this is inspired from him. Yes. Yeah. This is this is exactly inspired from them because uh, it was Richard Thaler that advised yeah. Jeffrey Airport on this problem. There you go. So this is directly stolen from them. The idea is. Yeah. Inspired. <laughs> so, <laughs> I actually would like to refer back to a point that Chuck, I mean, earlier made and uh, you were talking about, I mean, uh, from your perspective, the reason I think Chuck was also a little apprehensive to use the Jugard word per se, and you were also quite enthusiastic is because in your context, working in the UK, Jugard is actually a very positive thing because it helps you break out of all of these regulations yeah. and work in that positive way. The problem why Jugard has become a little of a little bit of a bad word in India is because in the absence of any kind of system, the, the thing is it's become it's become a substitute for building any kind of positive systems of working. 
different systems different whether it's medicine whether it's, uh, everyone seems to think that okay when the time comes we'll figure out some jugad and do something about it jugad works beautifully if you have an existing system and you use innovative ways to break out of it as you have done where you had existing systems and broke out of it versus just saying that okay we'll figure out what it comes it's it, jugad is a substitute for laziness right uh, and laziness or bad planning or bad uh, in, uh, infrastructure and I, i think in large part i agree with you and just because when i first saw you because i'd obviously not seen you before this call i saw you and the first thought was he looks like a young shrikant <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah, so so <laughs> then what i'm going to say is this is like the difference between the indian team of the 80s and the indian team of the of the last 10 years yeah uh, so in the 80s we used to win matches by essentially individual brilliance yeah in today's indian team individual brilliance okay you still have a few really brilliant people but this is not a team of superstars this is a team of yeah. players and they play on a system yeah exactly so it is it is what you will get is uh, in a team that relies on superstars or jugad mm-hmm. one or the other Very person will do it but i there isn't a system to decide who's going to do what uh, yeah. it will occasionally produce really good results and the individual people who are good are going to be really good some indian doctors i know are amongst the smartest people i know the problem is that we also have some who are not so i would say the average level of your doctor the average doctor is safer in this system but uh, you will not find as many brilliant doctors uh, as as you do in india uh, yeah. and which is which is which was the same as uh, you know uh well uh, australia or england could never have produced viv richards could they absolutely and that's where it, it, that's the difference between i mean uh, it's it's a system will help you win a league versus a yes. individual brilliance will help you win like a final or a playoff Yeah, you know, absolutely. So it, yeah. that's where it's at. Like over a period of time, the system wins out because the average performer is always consistently performing, and the system wins out there. So interestingly, why India has not won an ICC final in yeah. a long time? But, so. <laughs> the, the, yeah, the, the bigger reason, though, I will say, in Indian ICUs, is that with a very small proportion that I will not that are brilliant. For the biggest problem I find with most Indian ICUs and with the Indian healthcare system. is that we do not respect our nursing staff we do not yeah. respect our nursing staff we do not pay our nursing staff enough and so while especially now that the economic situation is so different from what it was 20 years ago uh we find a lot of in our indian doctors they come over here i currently have four clinical fellows from india four senior fellows uh, who've all done their intensive care in india they've come here for two or three years of experience and then they'll go back and the universal thing i hear from them every day is your nurses your doctors aren't that much better than indian doctors it's very similar and actually these guys that come over they are all really really good they are at par with any of my final year trainees final year as in you know people that have 10 10 years of icu uh, they are at par with them no doubt about that but uh the nursing staff because they are not respected over here if a nurse tells a senior consultant i don't think you should do this you will not do it or you will spend 10 minutes explaining why you are going to do it just so there there's a lot more collaborative team culture uh when as uh, in india it becomes very difficult we are in intrinsically very hierarchical yeah and one of the things that i find helps is we are a first name unit if you are going to start objecting to some to something by saying sir i don't think we should do this mm. that won't happen mm. because sir will probably not listen and we don't pay them enough so a doctor today coming over here will double or triple their salary but their expenses will go up as well so it doesn't matter a nurse in india uh, over here nurses uh, our senior nurses get paid about 50 to 60% of what i get paid in india they would get paid 10% of what well, i would get paid so nurses all the good nurses and this is what i hear all the time the good nurses tend to leave yeah a lot of the good motivated nurses unless they have a real reason to stay in india they tend to leave our icus are full of indian nurses and they are all really really good and they are all happy here because they say that they get more respect yeah absolutely uh, but do you yeah. bank plates for them 
Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it was just being yes. uh, Last year, for, for 10 weeks, every Thursday evening at 8 o'clock, people would come out and they would clap for the NHS. Yeah. 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 So they did that for 10 weeks last year. Amazing. No plates, though. No place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. doctor, from what you're saying, essentially the key part of the intensive care unit is, is the availability of human resources itself and how they absolutely look after. trained human resources yeah. is number one. Then is the infrastructure. Oh, can I come back to infrastructure? Yes, mm. since I said yeah. that word. So I, I actually had thing. an observation there, which yeah, was course. that I, I don't know if it's uh, true or not, because in Indian hospitals, at least the ICU is always air conditioned, whereas the rest of the wards or rooms need not necessarily be. Is that is that just because you can charge more or is there a real reason and, for that? And, and on that, and just as a, a infrastructure point on the ICUs, I think recently there was this... Um, fire in uh, an ICU in Iran, uh, right? I'm coming to that. That yeah, is so exactly was, what I'm going to talk about. And, and one of the reasons was that the oxygen was passing through the roof, the, the, the ceiling of the, the drop ceiling of the ICU. And that, that, that's something I wanted to ask you about, about the design of the ICU overall and yeah. how important that is. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So what we have is, uh, we have, and, and every country has this, India has these standards as well. Uh, but they're slightly variably enforced. Now, you know, just like we have fire standards, uh, there is something in the UK called Hospital Building Note Regulations 5.2 uh, Construction uh, Standards for an Intensive Care Unit. And we have just revised them, uh, taking lessons from the pandemic. And uh, one of the things is, so going to your air conditioning point, in a typical office 20 years ago, there was a computer room. That was the only room that yeah. was air conditioned. It's the equipment and you can charge more. But basically, I think that is a thing of the past. Now, whole hospitals are air conditioned. Yeah. But the thing is that in intensive care, you have patients. The, the real reason is you have patients that have very unstable hemodynamics. Their hands will be warm and flushed. They will start sweating you will start losing fluid and the blood flow will be directed to the peripheries rather than to the central essential organs. So actually it's better to keep it slightly cooler, but keep them at a reasonable temperature. So you want to mm -hmm. have very controlled conditions for temperature rather than swings. Mm -hmm. Having said that, most Indian ICUs are cooled way more than yeah, uh, we cool our ICU. It's frozen, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They are we cooled way, way further down than you really need to. But yes, so you need to have a controlled temperature condition, but it doesn't need to be at 15 degrees. We keep our ICUs at 21 standard. So their blood pressure may be dropping. Uh, you put them in an uncontrolled temperature, you will get vasoconstriction, sweating, uh, sorry, vasodilatation. So there's, right. so that's one. The second thing is electrics. No one thinks about it, no one talks about it. In a typical ICU bed, we are expected by standards to have 28 electric sockets, of which uh, four have to uh, be uh, capable of sustaining up to 20 amperes. And in the in America, that would be 40 amperes. Yeah. So low voltage. Yeah. Low voltage. And uh, half of them, um, and they have to be clearly marked, have to be connected to UPS supply. And so there are standards around this. When we expanded our ICUs to the wards, a typical ward bed has two sockets. So um, we thought about how do we get around this? And rather than buying, and, and we, we, we talked to our medical engineers and they advised us very strongly that rather than buying the five pound extension lead with you know six months, six bucks, uh, we go for the expensive medical rated equipment, which cost 500 pounds each. So we converted each of them into a 10 thing, but it was guaranteed spark-free surge protection, all of mm. that stuff. Even with that, two hospitals in the UK, the, the what you did was you protected the plug, you protected the local area. The local area is important because once you're giving lots, six people oxygen in a bay, in a ward, you get ICUs have standards for ventilation. So there has to be airflow, air exchange, so that you do not get a buildup of oxygen in the environment. Mm. Because once you get about 24%, that becomes essentially a flammable mix. Yeah. One spark will ignite it. Just that so difference. So 21 to 24 becomes a hazard. Yeah. Yeah. 24 is the limit uh, imposed by the UK Fire Service, even though I've read some papers that say you have to get up to about 26. But 
again, it doesn't matter. It is not that big a change. On the ward, we do not have the same ventilation standards because we do not give that much oxygen on the wards. So if you expand your ICU out, it's a problem. So even in winter, we had to keep the windows open by four inches or six inches, uh, which made it cold uh, and set off a whole whole new set of problems. Uh, But you did all of this. And then what we didn't think about was, okay, in a ward, we put so much equipment, the wire overloaded. So we had had, uh, someone spent burning plastic. We did not thankfully have a fire and it was 20 meters away from the ward because the whole ward circuit has had overloaded. And for some reason, mm-hmm. it did not trip. And what I find is when I see a lot of ICUs and hospitals in India, I, when I see f- news footage, uh, unfortunately, I find that they're using a lot of multiplugs, which will yeah. spark. And that is always going to be a fire risk. Again, when I was in India, our ICU had a home-rated air conditioning unit rather than an industrial-rated air conditioning unit. And home-rated air conditioning units aren't supposed to run, you know, for weeks on end without stopping for even one minute. Yeah. So it's infrastructure problem, but a lot of it is the standards exist. It is adherence to standards because the problem is the stuff that matches up to your industrial or healthcare standards ends up costing four or five times more. Yeah. Yeah, no, comes, I, yeah. Some of it is testing. Some of it is it has to. The volume is low, so they cannot. They have to. They cannot be a volume player. And the other big problem is they know they have a captive market. There are only going to be two or three suppliers of medical grade equipment, whereas normal electrical equipment, you know, you can go anywhere and buy whatever you want. Yeah. And we are going to take a break right about here for the first episode. Yes, there are two episodes because when we started talking to Dr. Nitin, there were just so many questions that came up that uh, we decided on the fly to do two episodes. So this is a very awkward ending to the first episode. So guys, say something so that this is less awkward. No, uh, yeah. Rain still has to tell us to stay safe. No? Yeah. yeah, stay safe for the first episode. Huh? Yeah. But uh, yeah. stay tuned. In stay tuned, yeah. yeah. <laughs> stay safe, stay tuned and stay simplified. Stay yeah. tuned. Okay, no, okay. Uh, never mind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. I hope you enjoyed that show. If you aren't following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. I'd like to thank the sponsor on the network this week, Credencia. Thank you so much for making this possible. On Cyrus Says, Cyrus was joined by actress Shia Pilgalkar to talk about her career in acting. On Begin the Journey, Ashish Vidyarthi lists down the modern concepts of friendship and how one can choose the right friend circle in life on Begin the Journey. On The Habit Coach, Ashton Doctor was joined by Aisha Bilamoria to talk about running and developing an athletic mentality. Farhad and Sunetra are joined by LGBTQ workplace advocate Suresh Ramdas to discuss the new normal and queer relationships on GBCD. On Tere Mide Raste, Keshav Chaturvedi takes us to the riverbanks of Banaras and describes the soulful mornings to us. And finally, on the Positively Unlimited podcast, Chetna Chakravarti takes the fear of the word responsibility. And with that, I hope to see you again next week. Hi, I am Sadaf. And I am Arshit. Khani ka itihas, economics, policy, psychology, sab hai menu pe. Only on the Nankali podcast. Every Wednesday, Sif IVM podcast app ya website par. Ya fir jahan se bhi aap apne podcast sunte ho. Hold up. 